Good morning, everybody. What's going on? It's your girl, Deshaun LaFay, with the Deshaun LaFay Experience. Coming at you once again, back on the porch. It's a nice day. I've been out here pretty much since 7 this morning. So, what's up with you all? What's cracking? What it do? What it do, booze? What it do? <laughs> What's going on, you guys? Hi. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, y'all. Good morning. <laughs> what's going on everybody good morning good morning once again it's your girl deshaun lafay with the deshaun lafay experience <laughs> for absolutely nothing <coughs> and um i'm coming at you once again live and in full effect to give you my commentary on life um, different subjects and stuff like that. So I definitely appreciate when you guys come by. I hope you have your coffee, you got your water, your juice, whatever you drink, so we can be enjoying our little chat together. Yes. So um, I just want to talk about parenting. I want to talk about being a parent. Good morning. Good morning. I want to talk about. I want to talk about the responsibility of being a parent. Hey, baby. Hi, Sai. And what that means. Well, and I, I want to give, like, my story. <clears throat> I, want to, I want to give my story. Um, kind of like why I do what I do, why I say, do the things that I do. Who, you know, just, so a lot of you all know, or you may not know, that I have five children. My <clears throat> my oldest child is 32 this year in October, and my youngest child is 16, and he'll be 17 in January. I have been having children since I was 16 years old. Uh... My childhood wasn't uh, ideal, basically. Um, so I'm just going to give my story right quick. But let me give a little disclaimer. This morning, I shared a video of a live from Daisha I Am. She is a beautiful soul. She inspires me greatly. And I was thinking about what I wanted to say because this has been on my heart. This is just some, some, something that I've been feeling and stuff that I really, I really need to say. And so, um, I'm like, all right, Spirit, you know, I'm listening to what I was supposed to say. And I click on and I see Daisha. And she is just so full of the Spirit and she inspires me greatly. So I said, okay, I am supposed to say what I'm supposed to say because... I'm a light worker and we all like it's more than just one. It has to be more than just one to help raise the vibration in this time frame and, and social construct that we're in right now. We're all responsible for raising the vibration and it starts with yourself. So when you start to raise your vibration, then everybody else's vibration around you raises or they fall off. And then you move into a whole nother dimension of vibrating and being because you've you've changed your vibration, right? <clears throat> okay, so my childhood was like really crazy because nobody knew that I was going to be born until the day I got here. So January 6, 1971, my grandmother, my great-grandmother, and my uncle found out that my mother was pregnant. And, um... My mother had had a troubled childhood herself. 
she was um, a, a troubled youth. She had a lot of anger issues for whatever reason. And she acted out a lot in school. She got into a lot of fights. She was suspended a lot. <clears throat> she got to the point where she had to uh, be put in girls' homes and stuff like that because my grandmother couldn't deal with her or whatever. Okay, fine. So speed it up. January 6, 1971. Here I come, bouncing baby girl into this dimension in this time frame and this, this, this construct. Not knowing anything, right? My first cognitive cognitive recollection was three years old getting out of my my crib <clears throat> I remember getting out the crib and walking down the hallway and my grandmother was in the kitchen and I scared the mess out of her because she didn't know that I could do that I didn't know I could do it I had just found out anyway so I remember I was eight years old and I was sitting in the car with my grandmother and I said who's my mother because up until that point, I had only known my grandmother and I kept, you know, she was, that's Mother Dear. And I knew it was my grandmother. And her mother is my great-grandmother, right? So I knew that. So these two women were raising me. And then right, right around eight, eight years old, I was just like, who's my mom? And she was like, Elaine. So I was like, that lady that comes by, that lady that came by here a couple times? And she was like, yeah. I was like, okay. All right. So... I never even asked who my father was. I never even went to that part. I never went there, right? All right. So, about nine years old, my grandmother meets this guy, and she wants to live her life, and she wants to go off, you know, traveling with this man or whatever. So she tells her daughter, it's time for her to take her responsibility. Because when I was born, my mother signed over the rights to me, to my grandmother, and went on with her life, basically. So at nine years old, my grandmother was like, no, it's time for you to take your responsibility. So I went with my mother. She was in San Francisco and she was living a very um, single lifestyle. And uh, no one even knew she had a child. So I grew up having to say I was my mother's sister. She would, she, so I had to I had to endure that pain of it was and I didn't even realize I was it was pain until I got older. But anyway, I'm trying to hurry so I get to the point of parenting. So <laughs> you have to research your past in order to know your future or to even understand your future and, and deal with your present. So I'm saying all this to help somebody. I hope I can I can anyway. Anyway, so uh I get to San Francisco and <clears throat> I remember there was this club called the Rainbow, I think it was called the Rainbow Room, if I remember correctly. Something like that. Anyway, it was a club, right? And all the people that went to the club would bring their kids and put them down in this, like, basement thing. It was like this basement that they had set up with, like, um, pool tables and little tables and chairs with cards and board games. It was a TV down there. We had, like, a refrigerator. It was all kind of snacks and food and stuff down there. And um, and I think it was a little bed in there, too, like if somebody got sleepy, I think so. <laughs> and so uh, she would be up in the club, honey, and they would have a, we would be down in the little basement having fun or whatever. Anyway, so... Over the, the course of the three years, I did become very physically and emotionally abused by my mother. She couldn't handle the pressure of having me. It was too much. Um, so, um, about three years later, like, it was, it was so, many, so many crazy stories with that. But basically, I had to learn how to survive. I learned how to, um, I learned how to survive during those three years. That's where I really, really, really learned how to survive. I had to, like, she would put me out the house, like, at 10 o'clock at night with, like, $10 and tell me to go find something to do. And I ended up befriending this, like, Italian man that um, owned this Italian restaurant. And I was back there looking for food. I think I was in the trash can. I bullshit y'all for, for real, y'all. I think I was in the trash can looking for food behind the restaurant because I figured... The restaurant would be throwing out food. Like at 10 years old, I was logically thinking. I had to be like a serious adult at a child, at a young, 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 young age, looking out for myself, making sure I was okay. So, 
three years later, I get back with my grandmother. She's so, like, I don't know what, because her and that man didn't work out or whatever. So when she found out all the things that was happening to me when I was with my mother, she felt really, really guilty. But then she, it, the guilt started to turn into anger and resentment, I guess. And then she started looking for any little thing to, like, you know, do something to me, you know, with her abusive. So she was abusive, too. She started, like, doing all kind of crazy abusive stuff, you know. Oh, my God. <laughs> but anyway, so when I was 14, I turned 14 years old. I was going to Catholic school. I was very much provided for. I lived in a well-to-do area. My grandmother sent me to private schools. I wore, good morning, baby. I wore the best of clothes. You know what I mean? So my grandmother worked, like I told you guys, 31 years of service at the VA hospital. So she was getting paid. But, you know, anyway. <clears throat> so she took care of me financially. But, like, emotionally and uh, spiritually, I was pretty much on my own. So I had gotten to a situation at school where... This girl, I was I was bullied a lot when I was in school too. I had two fights and I lost both of them because I don't I don't like to fight. I'm still not a fighter. My daughter knows I don't get down with that. Everybody knows. All my kids, they know I don't I don't get down with that. But anyway, so when I was 14, um, my uh, this girl at school, she said that I was trying to talk to her boyfriend or something, and I was like. I didn't even know her boyfriend. I like barely barely knew her. She was a, a supposed friend of a friend of my sister's, my play sister. Um, this girl that took me under her wing. We grew up, you know, her mother took me under her wing too. And, you know, we grew up together for years and years and years and years. So we just, that's like my sister, spiritual. My, and she's, she passed away now. But anyway, Kimmy was always fighting for me. Whenever we were in school and somebody would try to pick on me and they found out that Kimmy was my sister, they would leave me alone. So this particular girl, she tried it. She was like, I don't care who your sister is. I'm, you know, whatever. I'm going to bring a machete to school the next tomorrow, and I'm going to shank you in the bathroom. And so I was scared, right? So the next day came, and I was supposed to go to school, and I wanted to tell my grandmother so bad, but I knew that she wouldn't understand. I was just like, she, she, she's not going to understand if I tell her what's going on. And so I had, I went to school in Santa Monica, and I had to catch the 20. It was called, it, you catch the 20 down Wilshire or the 420. And the 20, you could stop, you could get off the bus, but the 420, you know, it had limited stops. So I remember, I remember getting on, I remember getting on the bus. And I was like, if I get on the 20, I could get off the bus at my grandmother's. Because my grandmother's job was, was in between where I was going to go either home or to my boyfriend's my boyfriend's um, school because he went to uni. He went to University High and I went to St. Saint, Saint Monica High. And so I remember I said, okay, I'm going to get on the 8 because I want to go tell my grandmother what's going on, right? But I was so scared of her. I was so scared of her and, and she would never understand me. She never tried to really understand me. Because, y'all, I was still a virgin. <clears throat> At 14 years old, I was still a virgin. I hadn't even, I think I had, like, maybe two kisses. I think I kissed, like, two dudes. I had a gang of boyfriends. But I think they was just, you know, wanting to say they was my boyfriend. Because that was it. I would just be like, you're my boyfriend. And they would be buying me stuff, you know. And, and nutrition and at lunch and bringing me gifts and stuff like that and saying I was a girlfriend. <laughs> we dang sure wasn't doing nothing. <laughs> it wasn't nothing else going on. So this boyfriend that I had, he was at uni high and he, he was a, um, a junior in high school and he was like destined to be a football player or whatever. Right. So he was like this, this guy, every girl wanted or whatever. And he wanted to kick it with me, but I would never give him none, but he was really trying hard to get some, right? But I wasn't, I wasn't going. So, long story short, I get on the 8th, and I go past, I'm getting ready to get to my grandmother's job, and I wanted to get off the bus, but I didn't. And I stayed on the bus, and I got off at my boyfriend's school. So I get to his school, and I tell him what happened, and he immediately wants to rush me to the house because he's thinking oh she's vulnerable now I can get some coochie 
So, we end up going to my house and I had to sneak him in. I don't know why. I have no idea why I let him talk me into that. I really, to this day, don't understand why I let him talk me into that. So, we go in the house and we're sitting on the bed and I was scared. I was really scared. I didn't know what to do because I wasn't in school, but I was scared. I, didn't, I, I just didn't know what to do at the moment. So, he starts kissing me. So we start, he, he starts kissing me, we start kissing, and I'm like, I, I, I'm not ready for none of this, right? And so, some kind of way, he's on top of me, right? So, we, I have on all my clothes, he got on all his clothes, and we're kissing, but I think I'm just about to push him off or tell him to stop, and I hear my great-grandmother in the doorway of my room. You guys... She was, she screamed, right? And I looked over and I was like, oh my God, I'm trying to push this dude up off me. And do you know that punk nigga did not get up off me? Do you know that he laid down more on me and put his head like so? Because he, he didn't want her to see. If he didn't, oh my God. And so I was like, get off me. So I pushed him off. I finally got him up off me. But my grandmother, my great grandmother was gone down the hallway. She was gone to call Mother Deer. She was going to call the CIA, the FBI, the police. She was, she was going to call Mr. Betts across the street. She was going to call Mr. Lewis. She was going to call Cheryl's mama. She was going to call everybody. You hear me? Mm-mm. 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 And I was already stressed the hell out. So I packed up my little stuff, honey. You know what I took? I put, I grabbed a bag. I put a couple pairs of panties. I put one of my little bras. I think I put, like, my little favorite teddy bear or some shit. Because I was 14. I put my favorite teddy bear, a couple of my books. I think I put like two pairs of pants and a couple pairs of shirts. Two shirts and a pair of pants. And I threw all that little stuff in that little bag and I was out of there. You feel me? I was gone because I didn't want to go back to my mother because of all the stuff that had happened before. I was out of there. So, after all of that, I was hiding out in, uh, in his garage. And there was a friend that I had made through my grandmother's friend. She had a granddaughter that I had kind of took to. She was in her, like, mid-20s at the time. And me and her had kind of took to each other. She was kind of like a big sister to me. And she had she had got married or whatever, so she had her own apartment. And so after hiding out in his garage for a few days, I went over to her house. I finally went over to her house. And, of course, she told my grandmother where I was. And so they um put me on the plane. No, I'm sorry. My grandmother put me on a bus and uh put me on the bus back to my mother and when we got to bakersfield i jumped off the bus and i got on another bus i saw a bus that said los angeles and i got on that bus i got in the back and i crouched down and when the dude did his count he counted me as somebody so somebody got left in bakersfield <laughs> and i brought my ass back to la on that la bus and i was like uh-uh i'm not finna I'm not going back to my mother because I just didn't want to go back to all that that was going on. Like, that was just too much, right? So, I um I get back. I get back to L.A. And I'm hiding in the garage again for a little bit. And then, um, <laughs> and then I end up going back over to, I end up going back over to my, my, uh, my, the girl's house that I told you about, you know, the friend of the friend or whatever. The big sister to me, Jeanette. Her name was Jeanette. I went over to Jeanette's house. Jeanette was like, what you doing here? <laughs> I finessed the taxi and everything, y'all. I had $9. I told dude, hey, look, I got $9. I'm trying to get to this address. And he took me. He took my little $9 and he took me. Yes, that was all them survival skills that I had got from 9 years old to 12 years old up in them San Francisco streets, y'all. I'm telling you. I was like, shit, I'm not... Mm -hmm. So anywho, um, I get back to LA. I get over to Jeanette's house. She calls my grandmother again. So now they put me on the plane. My grandmother get on the plane with me. She like, I'm gonna drop y'all ass. I'm gonna make sure you get there this time. Ain't no <laughs> you about to get there this time for sure. All right, cool. So so we get there. We get to we get to San Francisco, and I'm on high alert, high defense, cause I'm like I'm 14 now. You ain't finna be doing all that crazy stuff you was doing to me when I was younger. It's not going down, ma'am. And so, make a long story short, it, it's unfortunate. Me and my mama made up, though, before she passed away. We, we, 
Ooh, it was good as gold. I'm telling you, that's my girl. I still love her. I love my baby. I love her so much. And I appreciate every moment of her life, every breath she took, every breath she took to push me out to bring me here for real. That girl was, that girl, that girl was something else. So, me and her end up going toe to toe. And um, she called Child Protective Services on me when I got up there to San Francisco. And I end up going to Children's Court. And I remember getting to Children's Court. And um, I got to Children's Court, and I just knew my uncle. I was like, "Oh yeah, it's all good." My um, my uncle finna take me, right? I'm finna go. I'm finna go with him, cause you know whatever. And so I was like, "All right." So we get to the courtroom, crack my face. He was like, "Nah." Nobody, now nah, we good. My her her grandmother's good. She's old. She can't do all that no more. Her mother doesn't want her, you know. And I got two kids of my own. I'm not gonna deal with this. So you know, whatever y'all do with her is whatever you do with her. I was like, what? Y'all niggas just finna throw me away like that? All right, bet. So, um, from 14 until now, I've been on my own. Like, seriously, on my own. No help from my family except for. When I was 19, I had two babies at the time. Yeah, because Nisa, Nisa was born. So I think I was 22. Yeah, I was 22 years old. My grandmother paid for me to get an apartment um, five blocks down from where the L.A. riot started. So I got the apartment in like the year, like six months before the L.A. riot. So I was sitting like damn near in the epicenter, but I'll tell y'all that story another time. But anywho, with no help from my family, no like support from my family, um, you know, basically down talking me, telling me, you know, I ain't this, I ain't that, whatever, you know, cause I, I was having children. So my first child came at 16. My second child came at 19. My third child came at 25. My fourth child came at 27, and my fifth child came at 32. So, those were a lot. Those were like different stages of my life, and so when I was 16, I didn't know anything about who I was as a person. I didn't know who I wanted to be. I was still trying to deal with all that hurt and pain from the rejection of my family, and I was looking for love. And I was looking for acceptance. And I was looking for for a peace of mind and safety and security and some rest. Because I was tired, y'all. <laughs> Shit. I had been basically, to me, really 10 years old. But, I mean, for real, for real, like, on my own, like, financially trying to figure things out on my own in this world since I was 14. Because... In them girls' homes, man, they don't give a damn about you. Them people are doing that for a check. All, I, I, all the girls' homes, foster homes, temporary shelters, everything that I was in, in the Los Angeles County system of uh, uh, child protective services, with nothing but a racket. Nothing but a racket. I got I got molested by a, uh, I was 14, and I got, I got sexually molested by a, um, 20 I, I don't know he was in his 20s he was he was the son of the lady that was running the place waking me up in the middle of the night to have sex with me in the bathroom and i didn't know no better because you know it was he wasn't raping me or anything like that but you know now that i look back on it i was getting sexually sexually assaulted and molested in the bathroom by a grown-ass man <laughs> so you know so i have a son right now that's 19 years old and i called child protective services on him i did knowing that it was a tough place that child at that moment and his father knows his brother and all like everybody in my family knows right now to this day at that point in that in 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 my life i didn't have the support that i needed to deal with that child at that moment he was when when all of this happened he he was seven years old and there was a lot of stuff that had led up to this that was going on he was seven years old 
I was working this job. I had finally gotten this job. You guys, I had worked my way up. This was this was a girl that didn't have a high school diploma, didn't have a GED, but I took a uh, ability to ability to um ability to benefit test to get into college and I passed it of course <laughs> and then I took a placement test for college and I took college courses and I and I finished a semester of college community college courses so I use that to work my way up in the uh, administrative admin field and I got up to executive admin and I had finally gotten a job for like $21 an hour really nice job really nice job and uh my son would not stay in school he wouldn't do he just would not stay in school he kept fighting it was just he wouldn't stay in school his father was in a relationship with another woman dealing with her children and our son was not responding to anything it didn't matter if you took it away. It didn't matter if you spanked him. It didn't matter. I didn't. I just didn't know how to deal with him. Anyway, so this is so. I lost like three really good jobs. I had one that was nineteen dollars an hour. One that was eighteen, and then I got this one. It was twenty-one dollars an hour. I finally got. I got this job. Okay, cool. We had a really nice apartment. We had a three-bedroom, two-bath apartment. Um, it was. It was all three. All four of my children and me. And um, at the time when this happened, we were, we, I had got this apartment. Let me, let me be right on what happened. Okay, because I need to tell y'all what happened. So he was seven. I had got this job. We were living in Hollywood in this little bitty like back house that this lady was renting out. And so... I was trying to get myself together from losing that apartment that we had because he kept getting kicked out of school and I kept having to take off work and I, I was too early in these jobs to be doing all that kind of stuff so I kept getting fired. So I was trying to get my way out this hole so this boy goes to school and he leaves the school premises and he goes two blocks around the corner with these gangbangers. And he's outside drinking beer and smoking cigarettes with these gangbangers at seven years old. And this was after I had done like all kinds of stuff when, before we lost this apartment. Like he, it was it was an incident with um, this little boy in a pool. All kind of stuff was going on like with this with this little boy. And so I took him to the police station one time, and I told the police everything that was going on with him. And how I couldn't control him. I didn't know what to do. Like he was just out of control. And so the officer. He was a big old black man too. You know. He comes out. And he's he's talking to Shane. And he's telling Shane. You know. You got to do right. Da da da. Because you don't want to be back here. Da da da. Whatever. And my son says. Where do you keep the murderers? I want to see where the murderers are. And I looked at the officer like, this is what I'm going through. Like, this is the degree of what I'm saying. Like, we've been to counseling. We've been to um, me mental health. I tried to put him on really, I mean, whatever. You know, all the stuff that I tried to do, right? So, speed it up. I'm, this That happened before he left school. So, I had this girl. She was she was really good. Like, she, everybody wanted her services to take care of their children because she was really good and you know a lot of you guys with with small children or you know you know about daycare and being afraid to leave people with your children and stuff in los angeles especially it was you know hard to find somebody that was really going to take care of your baby and wasn't going to do it you know like just for the money or whatever because you know you could have them hooked up to your um your wick or your i mean not wick or whatever those little financial services that were available to you when you had young children at, at the time would pay for your child care so <clears throat> she had a slot for my two babies and I got her in, I got them in there and she was, she would go pick them up from school and keep them with her until I got off from work and I would pick them up and you know, it was like clockwork. We would do it. It was perfect. So she goes to pick up Shane from school and he's not there. They looking for Shane for two hours. I'm at work. I can't answer the phone because this is a new job. The $21, $21 an hour cushy, really nice job. 
So, they tell me the school calls. It, I'm going to get to that in a minute. It, that's Anyway, um, uh, I had friends in the, in the office, right? So they say to me, she calls me up. She says, Hey, they're getting ready to call child protective services on you. And they're probably going to come and take your babies. She said. If I were you, I would call them first and tell them to come get Shane so that they won't take the rest of your kids. And I thought about that for a moment. And I remember watching in the tsunami. I don't remember which one it was. I, it was it was the one a long time ago, not, not one of these recent ones. <clears throat> but there was a tsunami and there was this... Um, this lady that was holding on to her babies in the water. And she let go of one of them to save another one of them. And people ridiculed her and talked about her, about how dare she make that kind of decision and blah, blah, blah. But mothers make decisions for their children that people will never understand. You, you as a parent, and I'm not even, and I'm not taking nothing away from fathers because fathers will too. I've seen some videos of some, some amazing things where fathers have come out of nowhere to save their children. And they didn't even, their, their kids didn't even know, the children didn't even know they were in danger. Like the father saw the, the danger before the child did and they came out of nowhere and grabbed their baby. You feel me? So I'm not taking nothing away from fathers having intuitions for their children or knowing, you know, the well-being or having well-being instincts for their children you know but because i'm talking about parenting it doesn't matter man man or woman being a parent you you co-created and brought a soul into this world and so the whole point of all i'm what what i'm saying to all of that is that nobody tells you how to be a parent you don't know yourself how to be a parent. You don't know who you are. Like, if you started young, you didn't even know who you were. If you if you thought, like, okay, well, I'm going to wait for a little while and I'm going to, you know, wait until I'm older, you know, you, you, you may not be able to relate as much. I don't know. Like, you know, it's there's a lot of things with now that I'm older, like I had a baby at 32 and... I can't really relate to my youngest child the way I could my oldest child when he was growing up, you know? And so my my baby was seven and I called the, the Child Protective Services and I had them come get him because I couldn't lose my son, my little baby again because, you know, of all the other stuff that had gone on with them, with these kids, and trying to deal with them on my own. You know, I had a lot of trouble. I had a lot of trouble with my children because I didn't know who I was. My first one, I was too hard on him. I didn't let him be who he was as a person. People kept telling me, you know, he was soft or whatever because he would cry a lot. He was just a sensitive child, and I should have let him be who he was. Instead of making him feel like he was wrong for being sensitive and having feelings and caring about people and, you know, having to be hard. That was wrong. I shouldn't. I never, you know, but looking back on it, you know, you but you can't like. But now, right. Despite all the obstacles I may have put in his way because of the mistakes that I made. A lot of the good things that I put in him, I see. Because despite everything that he's been through, having to go to prison for seven years, having to be away from his firstborn child, his son, for, for a significant amount of time from that child, and come back and still see love in his baby's eyes, love and respect for his father, you know, and for them to be able to bond and have a good relationship with each other, you know, is a beautiful thing. 
and I know my son appreciates appreciates it and his hustle and his drive and determination to succeed I know you know he got some of that from me you know and my daughter she and I we had a rough tough time there for a while you know because me and her dad so to answer your question I'm getting to it now I have three different fathers two two and the one and when I got with my first child's father you know I thought he and I were gonna be together forever and when I realized that we weren't I wanted both my children to be by the same father so I set out to get pregnant with my daughter I intentionally set intentions that was my first manifestation now that I look back on it my daughter that was my first real like this is what I want and this is what I'm gonna have and this is what and I made and I I manifested her and now she's here we had a lot of trouble um because her father and I were not compatible in a relationship and he was 24 and I was 15 and a lot of trouble came from that whole situation for me and so when I got out of when I got out of the it was very abusive he was very abusive to me he doesn't want to admit it but he was he was very very physically very physically and mentally abusive to me and I did a lot of things you know I didn't deserve to be hit or beat on though I was a young girl like I said trying to find myself trying to find trying to trying to live my life I didn't know what to do with all of this responsibility and all the stuff that was on me it was a lot so when I got away from him I was 19 I had both my babies and I had started my career career in retail sales <laughs> so I became really good in retail sales I got all the way up to assistant manager I didn't want the manager position because I saw that was way too much responsibility for me long hours and not quite enough money but the money I was making assistant managering was good enough for me so um that's where I was I didn't have any type of like you know schooling or anything but I was trying my best with my two babies and it got to the point where it was just too much for me when I was about 22 I gave my children to their dad and I tried to get myself together he used it against me for quite a long time and then I ended up with my second child's father and he and I were friends for a long time and then we ended up kicking it we got a place together his mother died we ended up having a baby the first my my, my third son I'm, excuse me my third child second son Sean he was a preemie he was one pound 14 ounces when he was born he was he fit in my hand I had to go to the hospital with him I was at the hospital every day with that boy every all day every day I was right there by his side making sure he was he was breathing he could hear my voice I would put him on my chest so he could feel my skin, you know, my little baby. And now he's 24. Oh, I skipped past Anissa. Hold on. So Anissa, she's 29 right now. She is so beautiful. We had a lot of trouble, but she is beautiful now. She's a beautiful girl. She's in school. She's going for business management. And she is a beautiful girl. I am I'm very proud of her. And every day she says that she loves her beautiful mama. You know, she just makes me happy. I'm that was one of the she's just she's good so all right so then my third baby sean he is just the he just makes me i just that boy me and him we could sit on the phone that's the one that really knows me like he he really knows his mom he's the middle he's the middle child and he really knows his mom he's been through a lot with his dad he ended up going with his dad when he was nine so he and i separated from each other when when he was nine and he went to go live with his dad. He just wanted to be with his dad, which is no I didn't have a we didn't have, you know, he just went to be with his dad in Alabama. So he didn't grow up with me. But that is my baby. I love him so much, right? That is my boy. I love him so much. Uh oh. I'm sorry, y'all. I got totally distracted. I'm so nosy. <laughs> the police was coming down the street. I thought they were trying to get my boy, but they weren't. Ooh, I know he peed on himself because he's on parole. 
the police, you know, anyway, I'll tell y'all that in a minute. Anyway, okay, so look. Um, so, we, uh, what part was I on? Dang it, I totally got distracted. Um, my babies, my children. So, he is a beautiful boy. He's in Alabama. He's working. He came out here for a little while, but he ended up going back, back to, uh, to Alabama. He is 24. Oh, so my oldest son, he only has two children. One is seven. He just turned seven, Rajon. And he has a little girl, um, Ja, Ja. I can't remember the baby's name. I'm sorry, y'all. The baby's like six months. I haven't been to L.A. to see either one of my grandchildren yet. <sighs> anyway, it's another story. So, it's all about parenting. That's the whole point of what I'm saying. Anyway, all right. So, and then the... So he's doing well for himself. He's he is on his own. He's responsible. He's doing his own thing. Now my 19-year-old Shane, the one that ended up in child protective services. I tried really hard to get him out when he was nine years old. There was a lot of obstacles, a lot of things keeping us from being re reunited, and a lot of it was himself. The child would not take responsibility for himself. He would not stop fighting. Whatever anger was going on inside of him, he wouldn't let it go. He wouldn't talk about it. He wouldn't work it out. He just kept acting out, which kept him from being released from the system. He ended up aging out at 18. He came down here. I was so excited, you know, even though people were kind of warning me and telling me, you know, hey, it might not be what you think. I still wanting him here look you know you're here now you aged out let's you know let's try to work it out you know let's i'm gonna help you get on your feet so you can be your own man whatever it didn't work out he was very abusive verbally and i was scared that he was gonna hit me like a few times and it just it just didn't work out so he had to i he had to leave and uh he is on the streets of los angeles somewhere gang banging and resenting me hating me and feeling like i'm the 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 reason for his whole whatever <sighs> no matter i answer the phone every time he calls i help him as much as i can whenever he he needs it you know so i don't know and then we come to hosea my 16 year old he's in job corps he was homeschooled from eight years old until now he's he's been homeschooled since he was eight um no 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 not eight i'm sorry no no not since he was eight since the eighth grade so he's been homeschooled since he was 10 about 10 something like that 10 or 11 12 somewhere around there it's been a minute anyway so when he turned 16 we were like, do you want to go to Job Corps? We found out what Job Corps was. We took, we went to the um, orientation and everything. He really liked it. So he signed up for Job Corps. And he wanted to live on campus. So that's where he is. He moved to campus. And so he's doing really well. He's taking Cisco training and network cabling. He's going to get his driver's license. And when he gets out, he's going to have 2400 bucks. So I said all that to say. Being a parent, okay, when I was going through with those first babies, I was so afraid of them hating me, you know, me not, me not, you know, having their respect or their love or whatever and being rejected by them. Yeah. I, I've been thinking about it, like, all the time. Like, it's just, I don't know. He came here. I, that boy, Shane, he came here, like, he came here. When when I went to go see him in the nursery, he was butt naked. And he had his hands behind his head like this, and his legs gapped open. And his testicles were, like, so huge. They were, like, really big, just sitting there. And so I can, and I said, why is my baby butt naked like that? She, and the nurse said, he's sleeping so good. I didn't want to wake him up. I was like, wow. And he was. He was asleep, knocked out. He came here. 
who he is. And I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. He came here who he is. And I just, I, I just never knew. I just never knew how to. His dad couldn't do anything. I couldn't do anything. He wasn't afraid. He's still not afraid of anything. It's just, you know, so that's the point I'm making. Like, it's you can think you're being the best parent in the world. You can think that you're being the worst parent in the world. But like I say, I told you guys about my grandmother. I told you guys about my mother. I told you about me because I'm showing their, their examples. No, there's no such thing as a good or a bad example. It's just an example. Like, you learn from everything. We learn from books. We learn from other people's experiences. We learn from stories. We learn from TV shows that are fictional or, 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 um, or real. You know what I mean? We learn, we learn from, from day to day. You know what I mean? From breathing, from living, from, from being alive in this world. We learn. And so... You know, my oldest son and I, like, you know, we, we were, we weren't, we weren't good or on good terms or whatever. But one day we sat down and we talked and he asked me some questions and I told the truth about some things that he needed to hear. Right. And so we've been good ever since. Just like me and my mother, I was hurt. I was hurt behind a whole lot of things and I didn't want to talk to her. You know, I hated her. I would I was very disrespectful a lot of times to her. And one day we sat down when I was 27 years old and we talked and then we were good after that. You know? I didn't understand a lot of things about my mother. I didn't get it. But then after I got older and I lived my life and I started to understand things, then it was like, oh, okay. So, so it is with my children. So it is with my children. So this, my 19 year old, I only set intentions and hope that the example, me not going anywhere, me not being gone, me not being a crackhead, me not being a prostitute, me not leaving him. No matter what he says, yes, he was still in there, but I never left him. I was always there, coming to see him, calling, trying to find where he is. If they would move him somewhere and not tell me where he was, I would end up finding him anyway. So at some point, when it all, when the when the clouds go away and and he comes to himself, as it says in the Bible, you know, He'll remember. He'll remember. And he has four other witnesses to help him remember. Should he forget? I mean, should he should he keep continuing to forget? You know? So, it's like... It's... What I learned from the Oaski is that... I'm responsible for these souls, right? I'm responsible for the elevation and the progression of the souls that I brought to this physical plane. Because it's almost like coming here Coming here is like being summoned to a setback. And if you're already in that realm, you're already a spirit, and you're already there, and you come here, it's like, wow. <laughs> but... Right, that's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. Right. 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 So, just what, just what, just what Lou said. It's like, okay. So now. 
I have two grandchildren. I have two grandchildren. So, there's seven people that I'm in bondage to. As opposed to when I was 15 and I didn't have anybody but myself to elevate. Right? And because I didn't know and because I didn't understand, it's like, wow. Yet, the only the, the, the only thing that I find solace in right now that when when I when I hear that truth and I and I realize that truth is that my soul is eternal. So I don't have anything but time anyway. And I'll have more at my disposal in the spiritual realm than I have at my disposal now. And I'll have more wisdom. And I'll have more understanding. And I'll have more, more people on the spiritual side to help me. <coughs> so... In that regard, it's cool. But, anyway, you guys, all I'm saying is, be the best you can. If your heart and your intention is pure for your children, and you know for sure that you love your babies, and I know that I love each and every one of my children, and I have only wanted the best for each and every one of them, and I brought them here knowing that they're my responsibility and that I can't leave them or, or deny them. I can never say that they're not my children. I can never, you know, deny them. So... You that are parents, just know that you're an example. However you live your life, whatever, decision, dis, whatever decisions you make for your life, they're your deci decisions for your life. And your children make decisions for their life. And they can only get an example from you. They can either take what they learn from you and turn it into something good, or they can take what they learn from you and turn it into something bad. And it's their choice. So, at nine years old, I taught my son how to be an entrepreneur and how to go out and make his own money. So, at somewhere 20 years old, he decided to be the ringleader of a bank robbery, um, a bank robbery um, crew. <laughs> So, you can take skills and use them for good, or you can use them for bad. You can teach people, you know, whatever you want to teach them, but it's up to them to use those skills, right? So, however your children turn out, whatever they do in life, it's their, it's their choice and their decision. And we're not here to live through our children. We can only do what we do and... And just be an example. You know what I'm saying? You can't, you can't like put a lot of pressure on yourself because then that would be contradictory to the whole manifesting what you want and all that kind of stuff. You know what I mean? So if you want success, well, not not success, because we're not worried about money and stuff like that. We want children that are peaceful. We want children that are not out here fighting or going to jail. We want children that are not using people. We want children that are not, um, um, you know, robbing people or, you know, just, just being negative people, talking about people, putting people down, gossipy, that kind of people. We don't want those kind of children. So when we have, so when we have children that are not doing those things, that's what I mean by successful. Children that are able to sustain their own lives with when in, in and of their own selves without 
any um you know any negative help or influence or anything like that you know what i mean so that's successful <clears throat> i'm sorry y'all my ears started itching so it's not for us to live through our children it's not for us to make their decisions it's not for us to you know tell them what we want them to do well you can um, now you know you can teach your child what you want them to do but should they not do it it's not like the end of the world because everybody is able to be redeemed that's what i learned about the oaspi so even even in death these false fake gods that style themselves to be gods and get people to worship them and stuff like that even those even those souls can be redeemed there's still redemption so there's no there's no there's no <laughs> so look so did Daisha I am right um it's a vibe this morning there's a vibe from going out for all of us that are elevating others, that are showing transparency of our lives and elevating others through through our example. Um, and it's it. I think it's like it's like we're all getting little downloads of things to say that are uplifting and raising the vibration and getting the information out so that the chains of this bondage can be broken, so you can understand what bondage really is. And where it's really coming from and how to prepare for it because the more you know the better you do right right so that's all I wanted to say I just wanted to tell you guys I love you and that you know we as parents we're just here you know it, it, it it's not something to be taken lightly like if you don't have any children really think hard and long before you bring another soul into this world why do you want to and is it for selfish reasons because you know excuse me i'm sorry is it for selfish reasons because like like lou said you know you're you're bound to your child and their children and their children you know so um it's a trip <laughs> it's a trip it's a trip just don't let it when they move how they move let them move how they move and you just be there for them that's all we can do that's all we can do that's it i love you guys so very much this is the shine of ah, i can't talk now i've been talking for a minute my my okay look my, my throat is like horse mm. I was passionate about what I was saying. But anyway, I love you guys so much. This is Deshaun, <laughs> Deshaun LaFay with the Deshaun LaFay experience. Oh, my God. <laughs> Thank you guys so very much for watching. I appreciate you all so very much. Um, If you could just um like and share the video if you if you got anything out of it, if you think somebody else could get something out of it. Just like and share the video for me. That would be so freaking cool. You can catch me on like every social media site. Pinterest. Um, Pinterest. Instagram. YouTube. And Facebook. Yeah, right here on Facebook. The Deshaun LaFay Experience. I have a lot of pretty cool content. And um, a lot of stuff that I talk about that i talk about on my youtube channel and my pinterest board is pretty lit so that's where you can get a lot of um ideas you can see a lot of stuff that i create on my pinterest board a lot of things that i'm into i'm building it um board by board um um what is it uh what am i trying to say subject by subject and it's pretty lit so you guys check out my pinterest if you want you know to kind of get a little more insight personal to me or whatever I'm getting ready to do a collective energy read for the collective, whoever's here. If it resonates for you, cool. If it doesn't, it doesn't. It might not resonate now. It might resonate later. Who knows? 
who knows it's how the wind blows you feel me all right but i thank you so much for um being here with me i thank you for my for my um inboxes and everything that you all give me and show me all the love you give me i promise you it just means the world to me it really does it really does so i just want to give a shout out to all my babies andrew and nisa sean shane and hosea you guys i love you i love you no matter what goes on no matter what happens no matter what it is no matter how it looks no matter what <laughs> i love you i really do and i'm here you know what i'm saying i'm still alive i'm here and i'm not going nowhere until i can't so that's all y'all need to know that's all y'all need to know that's all y'all need to know you feel me you heard me all right <laughs> so thank you creator thank you creator for using me as a conduit to express the messages to the collective I pray that they're concise and they're clear and that they're edifying and helpful to each and every person that it resonates with. Thank you, Creator. Thank you so very much for the positive energy that flows through me. Hmm. So these were the two cards. I think that's what I'm supposed to pull out. So that's what I'm going to pull out. This is the message. See your seeds grow. So this is the spring card. So what I what I feel, because this is what I was saying to myself, that from now until spring, it's building time. It's going to be time for me to build. It's time for me to manifest. It's time for me to plant seeds. It's time for me to set intentions. It's time for me to say the things that I want. Call those things that are not as though they are so that they will be in existence. So that's what I'm doing. I'm planting seeds and I am, um, you know, manifesting what I want. So that's what I see when I see this card. Spring, abundance. Because, you know, rabbits multiply like, like, like crazy. So you see a rabbit. You know, you're, this this is basically saying to me that um, you're going to see the seeds of your investments and all of your productivity and all of your abundance shall come forth, you know, springtime, which is which is pretty cool. So you, all you have to do is be devoted and committed to your cause, be devoted and be devoted and committed to yourself, be devoted and committed to your goals, be devoted and committed to what you want in life. And you're going to see it come to fruition. Mm -hmm. Most definitely. So, that is my commentary and that is my reading for today. Whew, that was a lot, y'all. But I thank you all for listening. I thank you all for letting me share. Um, and just being there for me. Loving me because I love you all very, very much. All right. So it's your girl, Deshaun LaFay, with the Deshaun LaFay Experience. I'm about to go. But as always, you know your girl's going to be back. Love you. Bye, y'all.